All right, let's get started. We have a lot of slides. I, I think I counted 100 slides on this lecture, so we'll burn through it pretty quick. Um, before we get there, uh, some logistics stuff. Um, the PyTorch recitation is tomorrow. The slides for that will be released. Oh, no, it's tonight. I'm sorry. Um, the slides for that will be released, but the recording we're kind of going back and forth on. Uh, we'll try and get a recording out if possible, because I know not everyone can make it. But at least the slides will be up, and there's a lot of resources on uh, PyTorch online, so hopefully it shouldn't be too difficult to learn PyTorch for this homework assignment and then the next project, if you wish to use neural network for the next project that's coming up. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, regrades for homework one are closing today. They were supposed to close yesterday, but we were closing some stuff last minute, so we're going to close them tomorrow, give an extra day, or we're going to close it tonight, give it an extra one day, and then your grades will be locked in for homework one. Homework two grades, we're aiming for it to be finished by end of the week. It seems like it takes like roughly two weeks to finish grading each homework set, but we also have to go through like 180 submissions. Um, so, you know, it takes a while. So uh, please be patient. And then we're, we're going to try and speed it up as we get towards the end of the semester because we have to grade your finals and then I have to assign grades and everything too. So uh, we'll, 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 we'll try and speed that up a little bit. Um, what else? I think that was about it. So if you haven't looked at the homework yet, please start now, um, especially because we're not just implementing equations anymore. We're using a whole another software package to do things. So there's a little bit more overhead in learning to use software packages, if you, especially if you're not a CS major and like you're not really familiar with that kind of reading documentation and following tutorials and that kind of process for like a whole package. Um, so start that earlier than later, and I think you'll thank yourself. Um, so just just read through it just to see. Yeah, that's actually, the first home, the first question on that homework doesn't involve any coding. You just go to a website that already has a neural network implemented, and then you just run some simulations with parameters. So I think you can knock that first one out pretty quickly. So uh, you'll thank yourself later. OK? Cool. All right. So I realized after yesterday's lecture that I that the slides and like the homework didn't really align. There were a couple things that are missing that you need for the homework. So I'm going to cover that right now. Um, and then there was a question on Tuesday's lecture about activations functions having to be monotonic, because I said that during lecture. I, you might have seen this on Piazza, but it doesn't have to be monotonic. Your activation function just has to be nonlinear. There are certain functions that still don't make any sense to use as act activation functions for one way or the other, but there's, um, and you can, you can find it on Piazza. If you scroll down, you'll see something about monotonic activation functions, and you'll see that they don't have to be monotonic. Uh, in fact, uh, swish, which, which I mistakenly called swoosh because they're similar, uh, the swish activation is non-monotonic because it, it uh, goes like this. It's, uh, it's like a whoop. It kind of does that. It swishes. So there's a little bit on the negative x-axis where it's non-monotonic and it overlaps a little bit. Allegedly, that helps with more stable optimization and gradient loss, but who knows, right? Um, that paper is also on Piazza if you want to read through that. It actually does a really good job of going over the history of ReLU and why we use it and what the kind of things we look for in activation functions are. So if you're interested in that kind of part of neural networks, strongly recommend that Swish paper. Um, and then you can go down that rabbit hole uh, when you choose to. OK, the other couple things I wanted to cover. So first, um, <clears throat> and I'll talk louder since I'm not at the microphone. For I realize we talked a lot about what a neural network is, but like for a given problem, I didn't really explain how to build a neural network per se. Um, I guess it was implied, but uh, I, I wanted to explicitly address that specifically for this homework. So if you have some input of feature length n, in this case it's 5, so 0 to 4, right? So your input, you're going to have to specify that you have an input of dimension 5 in PyTorch. And then your first, layer, your first hidden layer, so when we say a one layer, single layer network, it means we have one hidden layer in the middle here. And you can have as many nodes as you want here. It can be five, it can be three, it can be 200 if you want, because this is going to be a fully connected. I, th I don't think I missed the line here. Yeah, it's going to be fully connected here. So it, you can expand this, these dimensions as much as you want, or in certain cases, you want to reduce the dimension. So this layer can be longer or shorter than the input. There's really no, it depends on the task that you're trying to do. And then finally, at the end here, this is the output node. So this, this is going to be like the classification task that you're trying to do. For binary classification, this can be one or this can be two. So if, this is, if there's one here, then you're going to activate it with uh, 
softmax, which is the same thing as sigmoid. That's on Piazza. Um, but you're going to activate it. It's going to return a value between 0 and 1. 1 means true, and 0 means false, obviously. And that kind of gives you a posterior probability distribution as well. You'll get a confidence value. Like if it's 0 0.5, that works like, I have no idea what this is, right? But if it's 0 or 1, it's saying, I'm confident this is a negative class, or I'm confident this is a positive class. You have to define the positive and negative classes. The other way to do this is to define, I'm going up instead of down here, but you can specify another node here, and then that'll also go here. And then if you softmax across these two, um, it'll normalize it so that these two outputs add up to one, right? So, so that's what softmax does. Softmax does is it makes these two values add up to one. And then so, you know, this means class one, this means class two. It's still binary classification. That's fair as well. Theoretically, they're equal. If we're doing multi-class classification, we have three classes, four classes, k classes, you just build up more output nodes, right? So y2, y, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that, but uh, et cetera, right? And then so if you have three classes, you have three output nodes, four, five, six, and then you softmax soft max across them, and you get a probability, probability distribution of the likelihood of each class. And then there's a whole thing about setting what threshold it should be, right? Should it be more confident than like 50%, like 70%? Like what's the right threshold there? There's a whole thing there. There's also a thing with model calibration, and this is also relevant to the previous methods as well, where a model might be overconfident or underconfident with respect to these probabilities that come out of here. So for example, if you collected all outputs that had 70% confidence of its classification, you would expect 70% of them to be correct, right? That's kind of calibration. Um, so there's a whole field there. Uh, so we're not going to cover that in the class or yet. It might come up later. But um, that exists. I just wanted to let you know. The other thing I want to cover is one-hot encoding. So I realized in the homework data set, I hadn't taken a look before we released it. I would have, I would have covered it on Tuesday otherwise. But I, I noticed there's some categorical inputs in the feature, right? So all the inputs that we've worked uh, with so far have been numerical, right? So 0, 1, floats, integers, right? But when you have features like red, green, and blue, right, we need to convert these into some numerical representation so the machine learning algorithm can learn it, right? One way to do this is to assign numbers to each of these classes. So red is 0, blue is 1, and green is 2. Can anyone tell me why that might not work great? And I posted this on Piazza already. So if you've read it on Piazza, don't cheat. Yeah? Um, because you're saying blue is much more related than red. Right, yeah, exactly. So I don't know about correlation, but similar, right? So red is closer to blue than it is to green, right, when that necessarily might not be true. So instead, what we do is we do one-hot encoding. And that's where we expand this one column of colors into a column for red, a color for blue, and a column for green, right? And then you imagine for red, we do one, and then for blue, it's not blue, it's not green. You know, it's not red, it's blue, it's green, it's not green, et cetera. So we break it out into Boolean columns, and then we feed that into the classifier. And that helps quite a bit. Um, it also depends on what method you're using. So certain methods are more resilient to this. There's some research that says neural networks are a little bit more re resilient to assigning like 0, 1, and 2 here. Um, but just to be safe, and definitely with things like decision trees and stuff, you definitely want to break it out. So um, if this comes up in the project, we still haven't settled on a data set for the project yet. But if it comes up, then you know what to do. OK? All right, I already burned 10 minutes. So we have to get through the rest of the slides here. All right, so we're going to go through a quick summary. And I have a laser now. So whoop. that doesn't show up on this video monitor. And I couldn't get the projector working. Never mind. <laughs> I'll walk up to the screen. Anyway, so today's lecture is going to be on convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks. So these are modifications to the architectures of the neural networks that we've seen so far. And they're specialized for certain tasks, right? These, these methods were developed to um, assist the neural network in a way to do certain tasks. And we'll talk about how that works. But before we get there, let's kind of review previous lecture. I'll get through this quick. Um, so the motivation is we want to learn nonlinear decision boundaries. Um, not everything is, a, is linearly separable. It, in fact, most things are not linearly separable. Um, some, there's existing ways of doing this, like adding features. Um, I also realize uh, this curriculum doesn't cover the kernel trick, which is like very relevant to SVMs and things like that. But I think this course goes so fast that we don't really have time to cover. Like, I think we would need like two additional lectures to fully cover the kernel trick. So write that down and Google it. 
<laughs> uh, if, you, if you're kind of interested in that. But that's pretty critical. And that's also uh, relevant for uh, learning nonlinear uh, decision boundaries, specifically with SVMs. It was a huge thing in the late 90s and the early 2000s. So definitely cover that. Um, so anyway, so we want to learn nonlinear decision boundaries. And we do that by composing linear decision boundaries. So we just draw a bunch of linear lines, and then we combine them to do that. And so we actually showed how, whoops, let me go back. No, you know. So we learned you know, how we can do that. We also covered the XOR example previously, where there's a whole thing about perceptrons not being able to do XOR because it's not linearly separable. And in fact, you can do that by composing linear functions. Right? Uh, you can build an XOR gate from AND and OR gates, uh, electrical, whatever. Um, so <laughs> neural networks, we formalize the method for building these composed linear functions right? with the nonlinearity added just to add expressivism. Um, so we saw how we have individual nodes, which are perceptrons with activation functions or nonlinear you know, functions at the end. And then we saw how we can add them up to be layers. right? So each layer is a, a collection of nodes. And then we add these layers back to back to create a sequence of layers into a network. right? So node into layers into a network. OK? And every time I want to go back, I have to go through the sequence again. And then we covered how deep networks are universal function approximators. So given infinite width and infinite depth, they can estimate any function ever uh, within some epsilon. right? Um, and so that's kind of a theoretical point. But the point that it's trying to make is that it, the models are very expressive. Now, there's no guarantee that you can actually learn that model, obviously. But the point is that it provides the kind of framework to be able to do that. OK, and we also covered this very interesting geometric interpretation, which I really like, um, where by identifying that the dot product between the weight vector and the input vector is, can also be geometrically interpreted as the shortest distance between a point and a plane. right? So if we kind of define a hyperplane with the weights of a single neuron, and then we do a dot product with the um, with a data point, we get the line that's orthogonal to the hyperplane that goes to the data point, right? Um, the hyperplane kind of acts like a filter for those data points. And then it stretches the metric space. Um, the, uh, it, it stretches the distance metric space in that direction to kind of push certain data points more into their own regions, more into their own clusters. So by doing this sequentially, it adds um, it kind of moves and shifts data points so that they become linearly separable um, after a certain iteration. So the way we kind of visually showed that is um, we have a bunch of data points. And then we have a, on the first layer of this network, we have a bunch of hyperplanes. right? Um, and then if we take three of them, and then we, if we take the outputs of three of those, and then we plot them again, and then we do that again, we, we keep splitting up this hyperspace of n dimensions with these hyperplanes. And then we keep stretching the points um, until eventually they become linearly separable and they're separable by a single hyperplane. That's exactly what's happening here, right? Because right, we have these three hyperplanes that are stretching it. And then we're assuming that, forget this, right? If we just have this one node and it's a binary classification, this is just Wx plus b, right? And so we're assuming that by the point all the data points get here, they're linearly separable, right? Because we're assigning a linear classifier with activation function. But if it's like Rayleigh, it doesn't matter, right? Um, so that's kind of the intuition. Yeah, so the data becomes linearized with a sequence of these hyperplanes. OK, so um, towards the end of the last lecture, I kind of burned through these slides. But the point is that now we can do this to do a lot of different tasks, right? So um, kind of in the um, com some of the more popular domains in which neural networks are used for this type of uh, tasks, uh, image, so computer vision. It's been hugely tr transformative for computer vision, where we're processing images and video. Um, it's been hugely transformative for audio, so signals, just one-dimensional signals um, over time, right? So time series data sets, um, it's been hugely uh, influential. Um, and then even for robotics, right, control, control theory and uh, con learning um, control algorithms for uh, manipulators and other robotic systems has been um, hugely uh, influential. Um, so this is what we're going to be talking about more today. Okay, so um, how we can build architectures to better 
um, be amenable to learning these paths. Any questions about the summary? Yes? I guess for something like Good question. That's today's lecture. <laughs> Great question. Hold on to that. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Good. OK. So today, we're talking about images. We're talking about audio and text. And like we said, we're talking about virtual and physical control tasks. The last part, a little bit at the end, um, just because the, oh, I forgot his name, uh, the PhD student that, uh, that set these lectures, uh, he was a kind of uh, reinforcement learning uh, researcher, so that it shows up at the end here. It's a good combination of the first two, but the main focus is going to be on images and audio and text, okay? So the big theme of this lecture overall is that in order to scale deep networks to these domains, which are massively complex, right, which will, and I'll describe why that is, we often need to use inductive biases to be able to better learn these tasks. We need to inject some a priori knowledge, some assumption, into the architecture of the method itself to make it easier to learn these tasks. Okay, so kind of keep that in your mind as we're going through these slides, kind of identify what kind of inductive biases um, we're um, injecting to come up with these architectures, right? Like, we didn't come up with CNNs just kind of out of the blue, right? There's a reason that um, those filters work, and there's a reason that architecture works specifically for image data, although they're using it for other things now, but initially, at least for image data. Okay, inductive biases. So as we develop these methods, obviously there is a theoretical motivation to doing this, right? To prove O oh, big O of N, we can uh, do this. And if, if you ever take like a computational learning theory class, that is what you will do. You will prove that a perceptron can learn within an X number of data points if the uh, data set is linearly separable, right? But in the end, really, what we care about is solving tasks, right? And oftentimes, these tasks are relevant to our daily lives. These are tasks that we want to somehow automate or uh, we want to do faster or better. So one such example, I, I'm, I'm going to go through a few examples. Uh, the classic one that I'm sure everyone's aware of is object recognition or image classification, right? Um, object recognition is more specific because Image classification could be anything, right? You could be class, the classes could really be anything, but specifically about identifying objects that appear in the image. Um, this can be single class, this can even be multi class, right? Um, and when I say multi class, I mean the, the detector could uh, identify multiple images, uh, multiple objects in each image. So we can say there is a motor scooter and a person in this image, right? Uh, things like that. Other thing, uh, one step further in this is object detection. So actually drawing boxes around each object in the image. Um, so you can imagine uh, not only does it have to know what objects look like, it also has to be able to tell where, where it is in the image, which is uh, surprisingly uh, not trivial. Um, and then one step beyond that is object segmentation, right? Where we can actually say this pixel is part of this object, right? So we're drawing pixel-wise masks on top of images. Um, to say, uh, you know, this pixel is in this um, image. So you get a tighter kind of outline of the object instead of just a box. Um, for certain tasks, that might be relevant. Okay, and then uh, away from the image uh, domain, one thing that um, you know is has been hugely influential in not just technology but also society is the ease of text uh, text translation. Right, Google Translate used to be awful, but if you've used trans uh, Google Translate recently, it's like pretty good. Right, it's 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 like fairly decent. Um, uh, and then text question answering, this is like one step beyond that where uh, you can um, ask a model questions and it'll answer and that kind of gets into the Google Assistant space, chat GPT space, um, et cetera. But the model needs to understand what you're asking, right? Not only what you're asking, but what kind of response it's expecting. Like is it expecting an object? Is it a time, place, right? Uh, it, it, it needs to be able to parse that. OK, a little bit more, and I'll go through this quicker, because like I said, there's like 100 slides in this thing. Um, <laughs> there's also a, uh, and then um, as we go into the kind of reinforcement learning realm, um, kind of agents is, is what we talk about, where uh, um, AI agent is interacting with an environment. That's kind of the field of reinforcement learning. We have uh, an AI that can play Atari. And we don't mean like the, we don't mean it in like the traditional video game sense of AI, where it's like plugged into the game itself, so it like already knows all the pads and everything. We mean literally giving it a picture of the screen, 
and nothing else, and just the controller inputs, and the computer learns how to play the game, right? It has to know the score, and it needs to learn how to uh, learn the score, but it, it can just learn without being plugged into the game engine itself. Um, Go, I'm sure everyone's familiar with uh, like the huge uh, AI, um, Go, AI, uh, the Go AI beating like the top player in the world um, a few years ago. Um, the, doc uh, the documentary for that is worth watching if, uh, if uh, you haven't watched it yet. Um, object manipulation, um, this is really hard. You put a camera in a robot and you say, go, <laughs> move this block from here to here, right? That's without telling it, turn your, you know, typically how you do this, you would give it specific motor movements um, to go from A to B, but without doing that. Um, Amazon, Amazon is hugely interested in this because they would like robots to sort your boxes for them. Um, or like pack your boxes automatically. Um, and then obviously autonomous driving is like the big, uh, large amounts of money, VC funding. Elon Musk gets in trouble, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Um, <laughs> so that's a, that's a huge field, and I'm sure you know about that already. Okay, and then this slide's interesting, um, and the point here is that if you, if you go one further t level ab above from this, and you kind of look at what OpenAI and DeepMind, those kind of organizations are trying to do, is they're trying to abstract out from just learning specific defined tasks to more kind of biological society level, uh, individual level tasks, right? So survival and reproduction, cellular signal maintenance, organ function, muscle actuation, you know, all these other biological things that we kind of take for granted. You know, these things were also results of optimization, right? Of like evolution, right? Which what's evolution, which is in and of itself an optimization scheme. So the point here is that, you know, it doesn't have to be something like this, where it's like a strictly defined task, right? Kind of in the high level, we're kind of thinking about these larger scale questions um, as well. Okay, so for any task, and not machine learning, for any task in like society, and like science and engineering in general, there are kind of two things that we look for. There's priors and there's learning. And you have these things at different levels for different tasks, right? So for like building a bridge, right? Like we understand physics to like a very, very good degree. So there's a very little amount of learning that we really have to do. Like it's mostly priors. It's mostly prior knowledge and frameworks and physics and uh, civil engineering, et cetera, that we build on to do our engineering. But learning happens when we don't have those priors, right? Or when we're unable to define those priors in the domain that we're working with. So uh, this priors, again, defined as the knowledge assumed beforehand. Um, the example here is uh, there's a process called fine tuning, which I won't cover too much, but where you start with an existing model and then you learn a new task on top of that. Um, Regularization like uh, could be considered a prior. Like we're assuming that we don't want the weights to be too big, right? So we're putting a restriction on it. That that is technically a prior. Um, the architecture itself is a prior because we're assuming that the task that we're trying to do is amenable to this um, architecture we defined. That's right. If, if if it was infinite depth and infinite width, right? It wouldn't be a prior. But we're saying I think you can solve this problem with five layers and twenty depth, right? Um, or, or uh, five depth and 20 width, right? That, that is a prior in and of itself. Um, and then also like the activities and the outputs, you know, the features are a prior, like which columns do we give you? And then like the labels are a prior, right? It's, it's, it's all priors. Um, now learning on the other hand is knowledge that's directly extracted from data. And when I say data, you can kind of think of it as examples, right? Um, so this whole gradient descent mechanism is a way of doing learning. Um, you know, we've talked about this at extense, uh, extensive detail over the past few lectures, so I won't go into it too much. But the point here is, instead of assuming something, we're asking, um, you know, can we look at the patterns, can we look at the correlations in the examples that we're given and derive some knowledge from that instead of doing some prior, right? Instead of making an assumption or uh, uh, deriving from uh, previously known knowledge. So it's a balance, right? So if you have strong priors, you don't need to learn. So one thing I want to mention that is that you don't need machine learning for everything, 
right? And if you look at all the startups coming out recently, you might be tricked into thinking that you need machine learning for absolutely everything, but you really don't, right? There are some things where we really genuinely have enough priors to not need to use machine learning, right? Um, so that means, that means that it's fast and easy to learn and deploy, right? There's minimal learning. So even when, if you're building a bridge, maybe you encounter something that you haven't seen before, so you need to adapt to that. Like that could be an example of learning, right? But the majority of the bridge building process is, has strong priors. But that also means that it's very rigid, right? It, if you need to change something, um, there's already so much there that you need a lot of signal to be able to change what you have already if there's a lot of prior. On the other hand, if you have weak priors, you have to do a lot of learning. And that means it's slow, not just computationally slow, but data slow, right? You need a lot of data to extract the same amount of knowledge that you would have had if you had just strong priors in the first place. But that, that also means that it's flexible and adaptable, and it's not kind of influenced by previous biases in your priors that you may have had, right? So for a desired level of performance on a task, we want to balance these priors and learning to obtain a model that achieves the best performance in the minimal amount of time. So it's a balance, right? Um, one example I want to show is like a genetic algorithm. Uh, anyone heard of a GA? Hands up. Kind of ish. So like a GA is a um, optimization method that simulates biological evolution to find the optimal like solution. There's, so there's like populations. There's like gene crossovers and mutations. It's very interesting. It, it's, it's a genuine like um, simulation of like biological evolution. But that's what you use when you have absolutely no priors at all, and you have all the compute and time in the world. And you also don't have data, right? So it's, it's a pure like grid search, random search method to find like your optimal solution. So that's like one end of the spectrum. And then here, you know, we, might, we still don't have a lot of priors, but we have a lot of data. That's kind of the assumption that we're making. So that speeds us up. So we can kind of find the optimal solution faster than a GA might, right? And that's the kind of prior uh, learning balance. So priors are essential. And then yeah, this slide has some biological um, examples in that you know, it, it, it's, it's impossible to learn a model completely from scratch without any priors. Right? And so we, we shouldn't hesitate to introduce priors into our models um, to help things go faster uh, with the acknowledgment that the, the, uh, those things are priors. So you know, we are all initialized from evolutionary priors. Um, and although we can learn a lot, um, we're still Kind of starting out from the base of what our body and our what our biology allows us to do. There's yeah. A way to like build in like a prior into a model. You mentioned like mm -hmm. deciding on the framework. You can say, oh, I can do layers or twenty layers. So it happens less on like the layer and neuron level and more on the architecture level, which is what we'll get into with the CNNs and RNNs. Yeah. Good question. Um, OK, so up till now, machines, I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker. Um, so up till now, machines have been purely based on priors. Now, for the first time, we can create machines that can learn, right? Um, a lot of our, uh, since the Industrial Revolution, uh, a lot of our technological process has been based on being able to design machines. Um, but up till now, it's been, I want it to do this thing, and I know exactly how I want it to do it. But now we get to make machines that also learn on their own. Um, and even though these tasks, these machines do tasks that we couldn't possibly program manually, they're still based on a lot of priors, right? It's not like we don't have any priors at all. So um, what kind of priors are we talking about? So the priors that we take advantage of are known structures in data, right? So not all data is like a vector, right? Some, some data has inherent structure. So it'd be kind of dumb to not take advantage of that structure that's present. Um, we need to take advantage of as much uh, kind of a starting point uh, as possible. So kind of the two examples that we're going to cover today is um, array data or spatial data, where it's a two-dimensional array, like an image, right? So that's one structure that we can exploit. And then the other is sequential data, or one-dimensional, often referred to as time series data, um, where uh, we know um, something's moving along some axis. There's some structure along a certain axis. Right? Like when we give a one dimensional vector to this kind of a network, we're not assuming that like adjacent uh, columns are like relevant, right? But we, we are for uh, something like that, where it's a time series data. So 
this really this is what really allows us to learn models on complex domains, and this is why CNNs and RNNs have been so influential um, over the past few uh, several years, um, or past decade, I guess we should say. Okay, so let's cover convolutional neural networks. Uh, any questions up till here? Great. So. Uh, we briefly mentioned some computer vision tasks, and so the one that we'll kind of use is object recognition, image classification, just because it's easy to think about. Um, and then what, the example that we're going to cover is uh, Professor Yi Song, um, because it was his PhD student that uh, made these slides. So uh, <laughs> we're going to use his image um, as kind of our example here. Okay, so we want to build a model that looks at this image of Profe uh, Professor Yi Sang and is able to identify him as he saw, right? Um, so pretty straightforward, right? Pretty straightforward classification, um, also called discriminative mapping from image to object, right? You're identifying the image. So what kind of information is contained in this image that allow us to identify this image as containing Yisong, right? So whatever that information is, we need to extract it and then we need to define some model that then does a condi uh, conditional um, probability distribution you know, based on whatever information is, um, whatever relevant information is included um, in that image. That's an interesting equation with an image in the uh, conditional space. But uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the point that we're making. So real briefly, for about 30 seconds or a minute, can, you know, any kind of, can, can anyone describe what those relevant factors might be, what kind of things that, what are you looking for when you identify this image as you saw, as Professor Yisong? Yeah. Face, good. Can we get more specific? Eyes, okay. Nose, mouth, right, kind of facial features, right? Anyone else? How do we know this is a person? Because right now, like, think like a computer, right? This is just an array of numbers. How do we even know that this is a person? Yeah. Sure. So there's like something round on top of like something square, right? Ish. Um, humans have limbs, so maybe you could identify limbs when they're present, right? So the, you know, but even still, like we're describing these in like super high levels, right? So imagine that what's necessary for a computer to be able to recognize that. Um, and then also notice that the image contains other nuisance information, so, so things that aren't relevant. So we don't care about the wall. We don't care about the chair. We actually don't care about what color clothes he's wearing. We don't care about what pose he's in. Is he sitting? Is he standing? It shouldn't matter when we're identifying this as Professor Yisong, right? So we need to be invariant, and that's the term that you'll we'll use quite a bit. We need to be invariant to this type of nuisance information while still locking on to the relevant information for identifying this as um, Professor Isa. Okay, so obviously this mapping is too difficult to define by hand. We can't even define it in words just now without resorting to high level definitions that we've come up with as society. So we need to learn from data. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a bunch of pictures of Yisong um, and provide those as positive examples. And then we're gonna take a bunch of random images that we found online or some collection of images, and we're going to define those as not Yisong, right? And we want to train a model, as we've done before, um, on this is Yisong and this is not Yisong, on this binary classification path. What did it say at the end there? OK, so now we need to define the model architecture itself. So the standard neural networks that we've covered so far require a fixed input size, right? So if we build a model, with an input vector of five, then we can't increase this, right? Otherwise, the weight vectors, you can't do the dot multiplica multiplication, like the dimensions don't work out. Yeah? Uh, oh, that's a good question. So the question was, how do you define um, the proportion of this data set? Um, typically, you get as much as you humanly can, um, but Right, so, so the issue with that is um, with not Yisong, that's very easy, but with Yisong, that's relatively difficult. We can only find so many pictures of Yisong online, right? And so you're fairly limited usually by the harder one to get, and then the other one needs to balance that, because otherwise, you know, you might find that um, your not Yisong 
uh, labels overpower the Yi Song labels. So if you have too many negative examples and not enough positive examples, you won't learn anything because your gradients will be too small. Yeah. That is a whole field of research. Is like uh, we call it label imbalance. That's the term, um, and and especially in the sciences, that's a huge problem. Because for example, let's say I want to do uh, um, a Mars dust de dust devil like detector. There's only so many dust devils, right? So we can't provide enough positive examples to like truly train a model. So that's where like image augmentation comes in and other strategies as well. So ideal is one to one. Oh. Yeah. And then depending on the task, that ideal ratio changes. So I said one to one, and I can already think of like five examples where that's not the case. But like a like a good baseline assumption is like you want one to one between the uh, different classes. You want an equal distribution across all the different classes, because otherwise you're kind of implying that a certain class is more important than another, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So you, yeah, that's a good point. And if not, Yi Song doesn't include any images of humans, right? Let's say we picked the not Yi Song data set incorrectly, then you'll find that you'll just find the human detector, right? It just finds people, and then it just assumes they're all Yi Song. So that co the composition of the negative data set is hugely important. This task is hard. Like if we set this up like this way and we try to train a model on it, it'd be fairly uh, it'd be fairly difficult because it doesn't have enough priors. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions? All right, going forward. So standard neural networks, like I mentioned, require a fixed input size, but images can be any size, right? Um, and not only that, there are three channels, which is a whole other thing. So an image is actually a three-dimensional array, not just a two-dimensional array. So we're going to try and keep things simple just for this toy example, and we're going to say, um, oh, OK, sure. So larger the image, you have clearer patterns but more parameters. If you have fewer parameters, you know, it's easier for the model, but you can't tell that it's ESONG anymore on that like postage stamp size, right? Um, so that's kind of a trade-off in the image space size. Um, and then with color as well, if you have color, you know, you might be able to tell this is ESONG better than if you didn't have any color at all. But for this example, we're going to convert this to grayscale, and this actually works for most computer computer vision tasks. It's sufficient to have grayscale information, unless color is like a very important thing um, for whatever you're trying to do. So we're going to say we're going to convert to grayscale, and we're going to assume that our images are all 100 by 100, just for this example. Okay, But clearly, this is not the case. So kind of the naive way of doing this with the model that we've already defined is to take this two-dimensional array of this image and flatten it. So np.flatten, right, numpy.flatten, into a 10,000-dimensional uh, array. Right? So that's like a very straightforward way of doing it. And people do this. Like, if you're doing MNIST, like, you can do this. And it'll do like, pretty well, uh, surprisingly. Um, but this is like the easiest way of converting this image into something that fits our architecture right? that we've learned so far. So if we do that, now we have a 10,000 space input. And then we define nodes and we define layers. Uh, the other question is, how many units do we need for a 10,000 unit input? Right? So the number of units times um, the number of weights that we ultimately need to learn scale by not only the input, but also the weights that come afterwards. So if you, you, know, you want to say, I want my first hidden layer to be 1,000 uh, neurons long, 1,000 uh, uh, nodes long in my first layer, the number of weights that you have to learn is already 10, uh, 10 million. Right? So that's a lot of weights that you have to gradient descent. And that's a lot of weights that you have to learn. So you immediately. You know, come up with a very large model, and then you have depth, right? So then it keeps multiplying. So the number of weights just keeps multiplying as you specify more and more neurons in each layer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it keeps multiplying, right? Um, is that right? Yeah, because it's a fully connected uh, network, right? So it would just keep multiplying. Um, so because this is multiplicative, yet we have to be very careful with the number of neurons that we have to define for this architecture. So if we want to recognize even a few basic patterns, because the input size is so large, because it's 10,000, the number of parameters explodes. right? So it becomes a really, really oh, come on, difficult model to train. That's the point here. 
So instead, we want to reduce the amount of learning we have to do. We want to reduce the amount of parameters that we have to learn. And we can do that by taking advantage, advantage of inductive biases, of taking advantage of priors. The priors that we're going to use for this task is the basic fact that an image is an array. Okay? And not only is it an array, it's an array with spatial structure. So pixels that are near each other, we can assume, describe a similar thing. Right? They're within the same object. Maybe they're on the boundary. But in general, we can kind of assume that there's additional information in this kind of spatial structure. And there's some advantage to knowing that a pixel that is, you know, that are next to each other um, contains similar kinds of information. And we can leverage that to uh, have to learn less uh, number of total weights. So we call that locality. Um, uh, there's some local structure. There's some local relevance um, between, uh, between pixels. Nearby areas tend to contain stronger patterns. So let's, see, let's look at this picture of Yusang again. Um, nearby pixels in the background, you know, they tend to be similar, kind of there's no hard edges or anything, right? It's kind of a gradient, if you will, right? It's kind of smooth, right? Whereas nearby patches that are kind of on edges of shapes and such tend to kind of look like this, right? If it, they have a line this way or a line this way or they have a hard edge this way. There's some contrast um, that, that we can kind of identify. So now we're identifying, we're going from pixel values and we're going into shapes already. Like we're going into lines, we're going into uh, edges and curves and things. Um, and then also, you know, if we go into Yisong's face, right, nearby regions have even higher level patterns, right? So things look like eyes, things look like noses, right? Um, things look like mouths. So this is the type of information that we want to leverage. Um, and I, I realize this seems kind of simple if you think about it. Well, yeah, duh. Like you want to make an eye detector, you want to make a mouth detector. But being able to learn this is the point, right? And being able to um, use in, uh, biases to, inductive biases to learn this quickly, that's the other point, right? And that's what CNNs are powerful for. So, so that's the first thing is locality. We care about patterns and local regions. The other thing that we care about is translational invariance, which is that relevant positions uh, relative positions are relevant, but absolute positions aren't. So what does that mean? So in an image, regardless of where Yi Song's face is, right, I should still identify that as Yi Song. Right? So for example, if I flattened out an image into a one-dimensional vector and did it this way, if Yi Song's face is on the top left corner compared to the bottom right corner, my vector completely changes, right, if I had flattened that. But what we really want is for the model to treat all of these inputs equally, right? Because it doesn't matter where the face is, it's still Yisang's face, right? I feel bad like talking about him like that, but he's the example. So, um, yeah. But that's what we mean by translational invariance. And I have some research on this I'll talk about at the end as well. This is uh, actually really interesting. Um, so, yeah. Yisang's identity is independent of absolute location of his pixels. I would hope so. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's, that's the other kind of big inductive bias that, that we're um, basing our uh, model off of. So how can we use these inductive, we, how can we use these concepts to design our inductive biases? So first, locality. We can do this by restricting each neuron's field of view or re restricting each neuron's input to a specific region. So we say, at any point in the network, you can't look at all of the pixels at once. You can only look at the pixels in a square region in which I define. In this case, it's 3 by 3, 5 by 5, 7 by 7, et cetera. Right? But the point is, I'm telling a neuron, you can only look at this square region, and that's where you're going to do your learning because I know that there's some relevant pattern within this specific patch. So that's one. Um, and I should mention, uh, the weights here are not one dimensional. The weights here are also two dimensional, right? So the weights that we're learning themselves are also two dimensional, and now we're doing matrix multiplication, right? Instead of a weight vector where we're doing a dot product against another vector, right? The other thing that we talked about is translational invariance, where relative positions are, um, are relevant. What we're going to do this time is we can say we can have multiple of these neurons looking at different parts of the image. But we're going to force these weights to be the same. 
Okay, so you know different. Uh, you know we have different neurons looking at different regions in the image, but when it's learning, we're forcing the weights to be the same so that it doesn't react differently to any part of the image. Right? It's it's treating all parts of the image equally, even though it can only see a part of the image at each time. Yeah. Correct. Right. Yeah. Th these are these are essentially identical neurons. Yeah. We're just formulating it this way so that they look at different parts of the image. No, 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 no. Of the neuron, of the yeah, the the learned weights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the prior that we're um, introducing here is into the way the model is architected, so the way the method is designed. The method still learns, right? This is a neural network, which the whole point is to kind of learn the task, right? But we're setting up the priors for it to do its learning better, right? The question that you're asking whether you can do this with priors completely, totally. Yeah, there's a facial detection algorithm that's, I can't remember the name, but it's very famous. Um, something filter. Uh, anyways, so those define like little black and white filters that are like size of faces, size of nose, eyes, mouth. And so they define filters manually. And then they say, if these filters appear in a certain order, then it's probably a face. So yeah, that totally exists for something like a face where we have enough, you know, kind of research to go off of. But we're trying to learn that here. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, moving on. So um, this is really important. Uh, you know, we're not, I think, I feel like when people learn CNNs, um, they, we kind of learn about how it works, but we don't really understand the reason why. This is why, right? We're trying to get locality, and we're trying to get translational invariance. All right, let's see how to actually implement this into the model, because this way, you could implement this. You could write this up, but it's kind of annoying, right? That, like, now I have to. You know, define all these, and then we have to fix the weights and blah blah blah. You know, it's 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 kind of messy. So these are the inductive biases of convolutional neural networks. It's just a special case of standard um, neural networks. So again, comparing this to what we had already, right? So first of all, we save on the on the number of weights because we have less lines. That's literally what that means, um, and then. You know, if we were to do a fully connected and multiple nodes, again, you would have like a totally crazy amount of weights here. But again, since they're looking at different regions with the same weights fixed, that's we're saving a, uh, on the number of weights that have to be learned. So overall, we're we're saving a lot of parameters that have to be learned. Another critical part of this is that the number of weights become independent of the input size. I don't think this is obvious at this slide. So if that doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. We'll kind of get there. But with this kind of architecture, we can input image sizes of any size, and the model will totally work. Um, but we'll, we'll cover why um, in a bit. I don't think right now that, that makes too much sense. OK? All right. So how do we do this uh, in a smart way? And you might have gotten a sense from the name of CNNs, convolutional neural, work, neural, neural networks. We do this by convolving, come on, convolving filters. So we talked about these weights. We're going to use the term filters going uh, forward from now because it's two-dimensional, right? So these weights are two-dimensional matrices, and we're going to define them up here, right? And what we do is we take that matrix and we convolve it. Oh, I should start this animation. We convolve it throughout the input. This is the input, OK? So we're taking this one weight, and we're convolving it, right? We're kind of scanning it over this um, input image. So we're sliding windowing it. There's a lot of different terms that you can use. Sliding window, convolve, scanning, kind of the same thing. And then as the output, we get out another two-dimensional array. So each of these squares correlate, or correspond, rather, to each location of this pixel over this input array. OK? Yes? So this is what happens after we know the For now, yep. So for some given fixed weight, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. for now, and we'll talk about the learning. Yeah, any other questions? 
This is really important. You, got, you have to understand how convolution works, even if you've like never heard it before. Yes? So we're not standardizing the size, but for image classification, you might want to uh, standardize the actual pixel values. So if you want to standardize like mean zero, standard deviation one, you, you can do that. But for this, you don't have to standardize the image size anymore. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll get into it. We need to cover pooling before we get there. And like, that's a whole other thing. Um, anyways, OK, so we have, we've defined convolution. You notice we have, again, we have one weight. They look at different regions in this input array, and they're local, right? So it only looks at a certain number of pixels at a time. That's the concept. So with this, we can you know, implement this inductive feature of localization and shift invariance. Got it? And then we get the feature map out at the end. OK? OK. Um, so for learning this, it's exactly the same. It's just gradient descent, right? So the gradient flows right back. It's a little bit confusing because now we're working in two-dimensional space, right? So instead of having, instead of passing one-dimensional arrays around, we're passing two-dimensional arrays around. So you can feed this straight into another convolutional layer that uses two by two features instead, right? And then you get a two by two output out, right? And then you can feed that into another node and then get one number out, and that's sort of like classification confidence, right? So and then you just uh, backpropagate all the gradients back using the chain rule, the same exact way you would have done before, and you get to learn these weights. So now you're learning a two-dimensional weight, ve uh, weight vector, weight, ma uh, weight matrix. I shouldn't touch this. This is like a TV. Um, <laughs> but that it's, it, it works exactly the same way as everything we've done before with these one-dimensional uh, networks. OK. So. We're going to get into a little bit of nuance here with CNNs. Um, so first, you can use padding to preserve spatial size. So you might notice when you convolve, your output size is smaller than your input size. If you want to keep it the same, you just pad your input so that there's zeros on the outside. And then that way, your output is the same size as your input. It's like a dimensionality thing, right? For some reason, if your output needs to be the same as the input, um, there's different padding strategies. You can use zeros. You can, you can duplicate. These values and fill in the end. There's all kinds of debate about what's the current uh, correct padding, but like, the default is to use zeros, assuming that your data has been uh, normalized between zero and uh, standard deviated one. And so you're kind of assuming you're filling in the average value, if you will, right, by filling in it with zeros. Um, there you go. There's also something called strides, which is instead of going one pixel over at a time. Uh, one pixel over at a time, you can skip, right? So if you need to reduce your dimensionality super hard, because the thing that you're trying to predict is kind of low, low dimensionality, you just skip, right? That's what we mean by stride. I'm explaining this because this is on the homework, I think. Um, so stride one is normal, like fully com uh, com convolving around the input. Stride two, we're skipping, right? Slide three, uh, stride three, et cetera. And then when we have multiple channels, so we discussed how images can be RGB, there's three channels, right? So now your filters are three-dimensional <laughs> on three-dimensional data, right? So we still convolve on the two dimensions. So we only convolve in the x and y axes. But your filters themselves are now three by three by three because of the three RGB channels. So now you're wait learning nine weights. Um, across R, G, and B, right? And in some projects I work on, it's like 26, right? You can have 26 by 3 by 3, or you, know, you can have any number of channels you want. It gets harder to learn, but it's possible. Um, and then also, when you have multiple filters, right? So let's say at a certain convolutional layer, I want the same way we can do 5 or 100 nodes, we can have 5 or 100 convolutional filters. That means that your output now has five or a hundred channels, right? So a lot of times in like image classification models, you know, you start with three channels going in. The first layer has like 24, la uh, 24 nodes in the first layer, and now you have a 24 by x by y array, and then you're convolving on top of that. Okay, um, so that 
that's kind of how channels play into this. And then when you add batch, it becomes four-dimensional, and that's the whole thing. Um, because remember, you can batch data points, right? It still works. It's just four-dimensional, and then you can't think about it geometrically anymore. Um, but at least know that we can do this with channel. Pooling is something we also use to um, aggregate values in feature maps. So um, in this example, um, this is, is this max pooling? Yeah, this is max pooling, where in a two by two region, we just take the maximum value and we just do that. And that's because if you have a, like a really large image, like a thousand by thousand image, like to get to like one classification value at the end, like you need a lot of convolution to like reduce those dimensions, right? So at some point we're like, okay, we're kind of assuming that these four pixels contain the same information. So we're just gonna take the maximum activation and keep that, right? So max pooling is very popular. You'll see that a lot. Also um, average pooling. There's another strategy called global max pooling where you take every pixel, not pixel, every activation, and then you just take the maximum value and then use, you use that for classification, which is why you can have any input image size. Because at the end, it, you just take the maximum um, activation that you get and then you use that for classification. Okay. All right, there's a pop quiz here. We don't have time because I like this topic too much, so we spent too much time on it. Um, but look at the slides and kind of try to understand why this math works out the way that it does because you have to do this on the homework. Okay, and then if you have if you have questions, come to office hours or we can talk on PSL. All right, cool. So, the kind of tasks that we do with CNNs um, to develop this and to move this field forward, there's a lot of these natural image data sets. Um, Caltech themselves have a um, couple data sets that are pretty popular. Uh, the numbers stand for the number of classes, right? So Caltech had Caltech 101 is a uh, hundred classes with uh, 9,000 images. Caltech 256, 256. Um, with uh, 30,000 images. The most popular one that I'm sure you've at least heard of, it's called CIFAR, which has 10 classes with 60,000 images, and their images are really tiny. They're like 32 by 32, so it's like really easy toy problem to test your methods on. We've kind of grown out of this at this point, um, but you know it's there. Um, and then CIFAR 100 just has more classes, and then ImageNet is like the yearly competition ImageNet like classification challenge where everyone all the universities and researchers compete to do best on this. Um, there are, like, on the competition data set, there are 1.2 million images and 1,000 classes. And the classes are crazy. They're like dog, and then like different breeds of dogs. I think different breeds of dogs are like 400 classes out of the 1,000 classes for fine, uh, for fine scale classification tasks. So like, you can tell that it's a dog. Can you tell what kind of a dog it is, right? Um, where it's like TV, phone, bicycle, you know, it has all these different classes. The full data set that's been, and these are like human labeled through like Amazon Mechanical Turk, by the way, are 14 million images, 14 million labeled images um, in 21,000 classes. And those classes are hierarchical. So now you have hierarchical information of this is a dog, but this is this kind of a breed with this subbreed, right? That kind of a thing. So it gets, it gets really complicated. There's a, and there's a lot of data sets out there. Um, Excuse me. There we go. Uh, these are different convolutional models for classification. Um, Lynette was like the original, but it didn't really take off because of computational limitations. But this is like the first, you know, uh, ConvNet. And then AlexNet, it really took off. That it won ILS VRC. It beat everyone by like 10% or something. It was ridiculous. Um, and um, it did really well. One interesting thing is that you'll see that it splits into two branches where there's like one branch that goes up and one branch goes down. That's because. Uh, Kruzetsky only had two GPUs, and so he trained like one model on each GPU, right? And then like fed it through. Uh, you don't have to do that anymore, uh, but that's kind of interesting that it was formulated that way. Uh, BGG afterwards, it's really deep, so that's that's interesting. Um, Googlenet has this thing where it like splits into branches, and the model gets to decide what filter size is correct. So we, you know you know how we said convolutional layer is three by three, it can be five by five, seven by seven, whatever, right? But it's not really obvious at which stage what filter size is appropriate. So here they're like, we'll just give you all of it, and you as the model, you can decide which one's more important. Right? So that's kind of the inception module. That's, that's how that works. ResNet is just really deep. It ha some models have, have like 134 uh, layers or something like that. So they have skip connections, uh, residual connections um, to help propagate the um, gradient. Inception v4 is the same thing, but just deeper, longer. Right? That kind of get the sense here. Um, res next, I don't know what it is, and then uh, DenseNet has a lot of skip connections that go everywhere between like every layer, right? So there's a lot of innovation and a lot of research into this field. Um, we've kind of converged at this point, to be honest, in my opinion, where 
Googling that or Inception is going to get, or ResNet is going to get you like 98% of the way there, and then any kind of optimization is specific to a, a certain uh, task, uh, in my opinion. OK. There's also different models. Whoop. OK, I'm not too far behind. I thought I was more behind. There's also other models for, so we've only talked about image classification. But for segmentation, for drawing bounding boxes, for all these different tasks, there's all these other different methods that you can use, right? So um, RCNN, um, you have an image, and then the model itself proposes where it thinks the bounding boxes should be. Um, and then using that, it classifies what it is. Faster RCNN, they just optimize it so it's faster. Some clever tricks going on. Faster, it's just faster. These are actual names of the models, by the way. Like, we like doing this in the machine learning computer, uh, machine learning conference circuit. It's like, who can come up with a more clever name? Um, mask RCNN, uh, it, it does masking, not just bounding boxes, so like pixel wise segmentation. YOLO is called You Only Look Once. Um, this is really fast, it runs in real time. This, uh, the guy that developed this, uh, Joseph Redman, his website is real interesting. Uh, you can go look at his resume. There's like, my little ponies drawn on there and stuff. But he's like a genius, so like who cares, right? Um, but like there's YOLO models running on your phone. Like I can probably guarantee it uh, for like whatever phone that you're using. Um, FCNs are fully connected networks, so there's no um, fully connected layer. The one thing I forgot to mention is in a convolutional layer, usually convolutional networks, in the early models, you typically had like um, fully connected layers at the end to do the classification. Not the case anymore. Um, whatever. Um, and then UNet here is interesting because you make the image smaller, 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 and then you make it bigger, bigger, and bigger, and then you go across too. And then at the end, you know, again, you get a segmentation mask. They use this a lot for medical applications like x rays and MRI scans and things like that. Here's a tumor or something like that, right? Um, that's really sad. I shouldn't have said that. Uh, but you know what I mean? Uh, it's used a lot for medical applications. I use it a lot for earth science GIS applications as well. Convolving, pooling, um, yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, these are deep enough that they can do that. There's also, there's also a bunch of other strategies. I'm happy to talk in office hours. Um, but yeah, this is a huge field of just like coming up with new architectures. All right, so there's a demo. We're not going to spend too much time on it, because again, I spent too much time. Um, but this is a mask RCNN working on the COCO data set, which is an autonomous driving data set of just like webcams, uh, sorry, driving cameras mounted to um, cars. So they use this a lot for autonomous driving benchmarks. Of course, for autonomous driving, you have to decide what to do afterwards. So this isn't all of it. But this is at least the vision part of it, where the car knows what objects are around them. Um, so I think this is boring. So I added another one here. This is YOLO version 2. This is a video that Joseph Redman posted on YouTube uh, when he was like releasing the model. No! <laughs> Why? Hold on. Once you meet with a TurboTax expert who will do your taxes for you, feel free to do not tax. You put ads on a research video, whatever. Um. <laughs> This is running in real time. So it's, it's a Titan GPU running at 40 frames per second. I guess it's the music that flagged it. Yeah. All right, you get the point. <laughs> OK, I'm going to stop tripping on my water bottle just a second. All right, let's see if I can get back to my presentation. There we go. OK, oh, and then one more that we wanted to show. So this goes further, even. Um, and this is one example of something called pose estimation. So specifically for humans, we're interested in getting poses of like where uh, head is and like your arms are and when your legs are because this helps for like animation and things like that where like rigging for like animation and CGI and uh, things like that. So this is of interest. So this is just from the video. There's no tracking. So typically how we do this, you would 
pick key points and then you would use optical flow where are the pixels moving to track. This isn't doing any of that. It's just looking at each individual frame and identifying where the limbs and the bodies are and for each, each person in the video. And this is not real time. This takes forever. Um, or at least this specific instantiation. But it's pretty impressive that it can do this at this scale and at that precision, considering it's just one camera angle, right? It's not like you have stereo video with like 3D depth mapping or anything like that. We're just getting it. We're just retrieving poses directly from um, this. OK. All right, continuing. I'm going a little bit faster because I'm halfway through these slides. Ooh, we have 25 minutes left. All right, so we also have models for image generation. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of GANs. Deepfakes have been in the news for a while, so you kind of know that this has been possible. Um, but basically, it's the same CNN technology. We just kind of arrange them in a special way um, so that they can the models learn to generate images. And the one big thing that came out of this is like the adversarial network, where we have a discriminator and a generator. So the generator generates an image, and then the discriminator model tries to figure out if that image is real or not. And then this whole stack learns at the same time all the way. So as the generator improves, the discriminator improves. And therefore, the model is encouraged to make more and more realistic images. Um, so that's kind of what this example is. Um, come on. So, so we have a lot of celebrity faces uh, as a data set. Um, because there's lots of pictures of celebrities, and so we can feed that into a neural network and ask it to generate generic celebrity faces for us. So it's interesting because you know it, it's able to do these faces, but it also you can tell it tries to kind of try and get the background as well because a lot of times the celebrities are like against walls with logos on them, so it tries to come up with logos as well. Um, anyways, you can you can YouTube this. I'm gonna keep moving on. Oh, that's cool. pretty creepy. All right, moving on. This is a favorite project of mine, so I, I threw it in here. This is called um, Everyone Can Dance, I think was the name of this conference, uh, of this conference paper. Can I play it? <sighs> OK. Fine. Showing up on the first page of Google might not be the best for everyone. There we go. All right, so this is out of UC Berkeley. This is out of uh, Aliosha's group. So the idea is if you have a video of a dance and then a random video of someone else completely random, it'll transfer the dance onto that random uh, onto that video template. So it does the pose detection first, and then it generates that video from the pose and the source video that you provided it. That's fun, but Pretty good, right? Considering, right? Yeah. OK. Where's my slides? Ah. OK. All right, I'm going to burn through these a little bit faster again. Um, so these filters that we learn, we can visualize them directly, which is useful for figuring out what the model has learned. Um, so the, it turns out the model's kind of looking for color patterns. It's looking for edges, right? These are the filters that are convolving on your input. OK, so that's that's pretty cool. And from an interpretive, explainative sense, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, sorry. Oh, forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of GPUs. Yeah, weeks, yeah, I think. And these are research scale. Anything made by Google or Microsoft is like unobtainable by anyone else. That's one of the things in inequity in like AI research is like, do you have 10,000 GPUs? No? OK, well, you, know, you can't really do anything. So there's a lot of research into kind of resource scarce uh, um, AI deep learning as well. OK. Um, anyways, so this is filter. Yeah? So those filters, like, use, like, these don't actually correspond to, like, the percentage That's right. So we're taking each of these filters, and we're convolving it over the entire image. And then so it's able to say, for example, like this one, right? There are this parts in the image that have this pattern. And the cool thing is, as we go deeper in the network, you know, these things turn into shapes, right? So you combine. Right, these kind of basic building blocks into shapes like circles and blocks and things like that. 
And then eventually, as you get deeper into the model, they seem to resemble common objects or common patterns or things like that. And so the network is combining these and looking at, OK, if there's two wheels like this and then like a blocky shape here, that's probably a car and kind of things like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, thanks for the segue into the slides. Uh, <laughs> so, so these images that are interspersed in between here, these are like images that best activate each filter. So that's like an, also a way of interrogating what the model has learned is by providing it an Im, uh, a set of images and saying, OK, this neuron really likes this image, so it must have learned uh, the uh, features on, on this image. right? So this kind of goes into interpretability and explainability. Bup, 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 bup. OK. So for sequences, which we have 20 minutes to cover, um, <laughs> we could convolve over them as well. And we do do this. right? So you know, we can treat it as one-dimensional convolution instead of two-dimensional two convolution. Um, and then we can also convolve in non-Euclidean spaces. So we've been talking about arrays so far. But you know that graph convolution is a thing, right? So if you have graphic, graph data, and like graph machine learning has like been taking off uh, fairly recently. I don't know if it's going anywhere, but it's certainly taken off. Um, and you can kind of uh, convolve over graphs um, to, to do this kind of a thing. And then that is very relevant for animation. And I'll show this really briefly where companies like EA have an interest in taking like a voice actor's recorded image and converting it into a character animation. For a fair comparison, here we compare our approach to VOCA. Acaban las vacas a pastar en el campo y mientras Damián, echado en la hierba, procuraba dormir o no hacer nada. Yeah, so anyway, so you get the point. So given just the audio file, it's able to generate these mouth shapes and animate your characters. And that's why your kind of very recent AAA video games kind of look like this, because that's the technology that they're using. OK, okay so quick recap on CNNs. We're trying to take a standard neural network. We're using these concepts of locality and translation invariance as these prior knowledge of structures that we can leverage to do image, class, to image, ta to do image tasks. Um, this this like totally limits the number of weights we have to learn, and it encourages the network to do a lot better on this type of data. Uh, and then using that backbone, we can scale it to a whole bunch of tasks on based on image and video data. All right, any questions on CNNs before I move on to RNNs and blow through it? All right, great. Okay, so recurrent neural networks are in the same way that CNNs were for two-dimensional arrays. Recurrent neural networks are for sequential um, data, right? So for something like speech recognition, where right now my phone is taking my recording and transcribing everything that I'm saying into words, right? For, stuff, for things like this, you have to take a waveform, which is how loud was a certain frequency at a certain point in time, and then you have to convert that into syllables or into words, right? So this is the same thing, same thing we did with Esong's image, right? Where there are relevant sounds in, in, in audio. There's irrelevant sounds in audio. If I cough, that's not a word, right? So it needs to lock onto the important signals while also ignoring um, irrelevant signals. Same exact thing. Um, also the volume, right? Just because it's louder doesn't mean it's a different word, right? It needs to ignore volume. It needs to uh, pay attention to everything else that defines what words are being spoken. So Again, same, same, same structure as we're going with the images with Yi Song's example. The mapping is really difficult to do by hand, right? I'm not going to say any of those things and like trigger all of your phones. Um, but for like Google and Siri and things like that, you know, it needs to be able to take just that audio and identify. Um, but how do we define the network architecture for this kind of sequential um, data? The main problem with sequential data is that inputs can be a variable size. And we mentioned how um, images can be variable size as well. But this is especially the case for sequences, right? Audio clips are always different lengths, almost all the time, right? So we need some architecture that's able to um, um, kind of uh, be amenable to that. And the point here being made is that you can use convolutional neural networks, but neural networks have a fixed input window size, right? Uh, convolutional neural networks, I mean. So CNNs. You know how we said like three by threes and five by fives? If we do one dimensional convolution, that window over which we're uh, convolving is only also like three nodes wide or five time steps wide or things like that. Right? We can't take like global information from the entire sequence into account when we're doing our modeling. So 
turns out, sequential data has its own inductive biases that we can leverage. First part here, locality, is that nearby regions are usually related, right? So um, data points that are at nearby time steps are generally related to each other, right? So nearby audio sounds are part of a single syllable, et cetera. So that's locality. And then the other one is trans translational invariance. No matter when I say the word Apple at the beginning of, or the end of a recording, it still needs to be recognized as Apple, right? So it, on a different axis of time, um, this uh, problem structure has the same kind of indu similar inductive biases uh, that we consider for CNN. So to mirror the sequential structure of the data, we can also set up our model to process data sequentially. So what we're doing here is we have the input at each time step, and then we're applying the same weight at each time step. But we're keeping a memory. We're remembering what we saw before through this green arrow so that we can take that into account when we predict the next step, OK? So imagine this is audio at the bottom, and then at the top, it's a transcription of the words, right? We're generating words from, um, from the audio. If this is like syllables, combinations of syllables form words, right? So that's what this green arrow is. We're remembering what came before in the sequence to make predictions after. Oh, well, well that's a whole come to office hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, attention you would add on to this. Or LSTMs are attention, essentially. But you would have attention layers on top of this. Yeah. OK, so the way we're going to, oh, come on. The way we're going to formalize a recurrent neural network is we have some input, and then we have this single node here, which is just w, w times x. But also, we're taking in another input, and that's the previous node. Okay, So that updates the hidden state. So we have some state, and then we're updating that state with the previous state and the new input. And that gives us to a new state, new memory. Right? And then from that memory, we predict the output. Right? So we do w, the weights times the previous memory and the new input. And then on that updated memory, we're predicting the new output with another layer. Okay? And obviously, you can do this as many times as you want. So you can also unfurl this like this if you want to kind of um, envision this in a, in a standard neural network sense. Um, I think this is more confusing. I, like, I find this easier to understand personally. But if you really need to formulate that into this kind of a format, that's what that looks like. Okay? Um, and so the point that they're trying to make here is because we can unfurl it, we can do backprop exactly the same way. Now remember, at each of these orange nodes, these are all shared weights. It's not like these have different weights. This is the same W, right? But the way we update this W is now we need to backpropagate over time. So this W gets updated on, th on this sequence, and then on this sequence, and then that W gets updated. Same W gets updated again, blah, blah, blah. But then at the end, whatever W you end up with here, you use going forward the same on each one, right? We're not learning different Ws for each time step. It's the same one. And that's the shift in variance that we're talking about. So the primary, the primary difficulty of doing this is the longer your sequence gets, the more you have to backpropagate over time. Right? And remember, we were talking about the vanishing gradients problem with CNNs, with deep CNNs as well. Same exact thing with RNNs. Right? If your sequence is too long, you forget your gradients. And you, you can't learn um, uh, as, as well. Yeah. Not necessarily. It's not weighted. It's just that every time we take the derivative of something, because of the way ReLU works, right? It's like zeroed out at the beginning, and because of the way different nonlinearity works, it just shifts until like there's no gradient left until the gradient. The literally the derivative literally becomes zero. Yeah. So the way we solve this, you can do this by adding an infinite number of step skip connections, which is not a good idea um, because it gets uh, very complex. What we did instead is we added memory. Watch this. This is something called a LSTM. 
So I'm going to cover this very briefly because we're out of time. We have 10 minutes left. But this is real fun. This is really interesting. So they added basically what is RAM to an RNN, right? So the input informs the following. First, it informs whether we should forget what we knew before, right? So this is saying how much of the before state should I remember? And it's also informed by the, by the immediate before step. But this is like a continuous memory RAM that's maintained throughout the entire network. OK, so that's, that's cool. So we can forget it if we need to. If we don't want to forget it, instead it goes into the input, right? And then it updates that memory, that internal memory. Did I get that right? Yeah, OK. So, if, so whatever, combining with whatever we decide to forget or not forget, we update that internal memory. And I'm not exactly sure why there's. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. OK, good. Thank you. Um, so this is the actual input itself. And this decides how much to use of the input when updating the memory. Thank you. Um, and then this gate. So And then you use that information as well as, again, um, the input again to generate the output that gets produced. So it's just it has a bunch of latches and gates to decide how much to use of the memory, how much to use of the input, um, et cetera. That's, that's all you need to know. Yeah. But it's an advanced version of the RNN where it kind of does a better job of deciding how much memory to use, how much memory to keep, um, et, et cetera. But it, it is more complicated, more weights and, uh, and such. But um, this was a big revolution at the time as well. It performed significantly better than RNNs on specific tasks, um, especially like text, NLP, that kind of stuff. Yeah? Uh, no, because uh, as we mentioned, like this is the same W. So the longer it gets, you just end up doing longer backpropagation. So you just use this same W as many times as you need to as long for as long as your sequence is. Right, yeah. Ba -ba -ba, LSTM. I'm so not going to walk through that. OK. All right. And then we decided to be even fancier and generate all kinds of memory networks. Um, Hot field networks was like the OG. And then uh, GRUs are simplified versions of LSTM, so appropriate for different things. Um, and then we, we got neural Turing machines, which is fun because they use tapes like a Turing machine, uh, if you think in theory. Um, and then it gets way more complicated from here. Uh, I'll kind of leave it at that. Um, but you know, it, they start to have their own internal registers and RAMs and you know, memory transfers, and you shift things in, ins and out of memory and things like that. OK, so up till now, we've considered output of the network to be only uh, a function of the preceding. We only go in one direction. But if we think about like language translation, right? if, you, if you're bilingual, you know that the orders of nouns and verbs is like not always the same, right? So if I say something in English and I want to translate it to Korean, right? I can't just go word by word by word because something that shows up later might need to show up first, right? And, and things like that. This is pretty famous for like uh, Latin languages, like Spanish uh, versus like English and stuff too, right? Like the order of phrases and such are totally different. Um, so what we can do instead of just going in one specific direction. And this helps for other tasks as well, right? It helps to know the global sequence before making your decision, is we can go in both directions at the same time. And that gets real fun. Um, so yeah, you have two layers of hiddens, each going in a different direction, and both of them help influence what the output should be. Okay? And of course, infinite number of variations on that as well. So you know, something, some different tasks that use also this kind of structure, um, audio classification, obviously we talked about that. Handwriting classification, if you like, you know how you sign on like credit card things, right? That's like a vector. So instead of an image of a signature, you actually get like an order of the pixels that were drawn over time. So based on that, you can actually do handwriting recognition um, based on like the angle and the speed at which you were writing when you were doing that. Um, and then text classification, um, um, text tagging, if you've if you're kind of known to NLP, there's some problems where you would like to know if a word is a noun or a verb, um, because it can be either sometimes, right? But uh, bidirectional, that means you can get the full context of the sentence in order to determine if the word is a noun or a verb. Yeah. 
Okay, and again, there's tons of options that you can do with this. You can do one to one, one to many, many to one. You can delay it, shift it a little bit so that it waits a little bit before it starts making its decisions. Many to many, you can, there's a lot of different variations that you can do um, with this kind of architecture. And you can layer them. So you can have multiple layers of RNNs on top of each other to do your thing if you, if your task is so complex that you need like multiple layers of memory, right? And then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and now you need a server farm to train your model. And then this is, this was initially when text generation was a thing, so like chat GPT. They use transformers now, they're like way past this. But initially when we were doing that kind of research, you would use the previous output as part of your input when you're doing your generation. And then that lets you write like stories and things, things like that. So initially when we were doing text generation, that's the technique that we used. Okay. You can also do this with pixels, um, with images. Um, if you treat an image as like a vector, I'm not a big fan, but this is back because they want to use, so transformers, we're not going to cover that in this class because it's not a deep learning course, but transformers have been hugely influential for uh, neural net, uh, for NLP. Now people are trying to use transformers for images and you kind of need to do this kind of a thing um, to do transformers on images uh, similarly. But you're kind of considering that each row of pixel is a sequence and, and going off of that. Yeah. You can do MIDI music generation, which is cute. This is Google Magenta, you can Google that. They have a lot of different kind of AI art music projects that are open source that you can go around and play with. It'll generate music for you and things like that. Um, but yeah, I fit in in time. So uh, just to quickly recap, for, for RNNs, we exploit sequential structure. So again, localization, points at a similar time step are similar or relevant, and then shift in variance, right? Um, you know, structures at any point in the sequence needs to be considered the same, right? Um, by coming up with this kind of an architecture where we're taking the same weight node and kind of using it across the entire sequence. Um, and again, the point is we're reducing flexibility. This is less flexible than that, for sure, 100%, right? That, is, that has more weights, that can express more functions. But for the task of working with sequential data, this learns much faster. Right? And so we're actually able to reasonably train it with a reasonable amount of data and a reasonable amount of compute. Um, and then we can do a lot more stuff with it. Same thing with CNNs. So just to briefly recap <clears throat> before you start packing, um, we've used priors and inductive biases to scale networks from this to other tasks, um, image and sequences by taking advantage of those priors. Um, the world that we live in is spatial temporal. Right? Those are the axes that, are, that we work in. Um, so we're constantly getting sequences of spatial sensory inputs. So actually when Dr. Lucas Mandrake was here, he talked about this as well. Spatial temporal data is, is everything. Even with satellite data as well, um, it's satellite images over time as the satellite orbits over Earth, right? Um, so if we're gonna have like robots living in our homes doing tasks for us, um, we're going to have to design machines that are able to take advantage of those spatial and temporal structures. Um, and CNNs and RNNs are the building blocks that allow us to get there. And when we combine them, we can end up with a model that can serve as an agent um, for interacting with an environment. So uh, CNNs gives us the vision portion, and then RNNs gives us the overtime uh, version. And then you can train something like this uh, by DeepMind. 2016, this is pretty old, um, where it learns how to play like an FPS kind of a game where it has to pick up all the apples. Right. So again, the only inputs to this model is the image of each frame, right, and the reward function. So these numbers are given back because the model has to know whether or not it's doing well or not. But the input is just the image, right? And yet the model is able to learn something like this. Just again, fairly complex um, for doing this. And if you if you Google reinforcement learning stuff, uh, like I think OpenAI is the one doing no. OpenAI is the one trying to learn StarCraft II, and DeepMind is trying to learn Dota. And again, like they're not plugged into the game engines. They're just using cameras um, and trying to get the model to learn. And I think like uh, that StarCraft model beat a couple pro players recently, but they were saying it presses more buttons than a human can possibly can, so there's a little bit of a cheating uh, thing going on. Um, but there's a lot of um, work. 
uh, is this? Wait, hold on. Is that okay? All right. So we covered a lot of. Come on. Hold on. We covered a lot of different topics. Um, if you want to come to my office hours and talk to me about specific things that I'm interested in, uh, I had when I was in college, I had some interest in interpretability, explainability, and robustness. Um, so can you explain what a model learned by actually looking at the weights and the different characteristics of that model? There's a huge field into that because right now neural networks are black boxes, right? So it learns, but we don't know why it's making the decisions it's making. We just kind of know how well it's doing. And that's dangerous for certain applications. So there's a considerable amount of interest in going into the network, surgically tearing it apart, and figuring out what it actually learned and why it's making the, de the decisions that it's making. Um, also, explainability, um, interpretability, they're slightly different. Some models can be designed to be explainable from the start. For example, decision trees are extremely explainable because you can follow down the nodes in the trees and, this, and figure out why it made the decision that it did. Right? But neural networks, a lot harder to do that with. Um, and then robustness, um, this is you know, how can we design neural networks as not just kind of a model, but as a system that is robust to our world right? and um, doesn't error out on kind of common edge cases. So the example I added here, you, know, you, can slap a stop, uh, you can slap a staker on a stop sign and you can trick a neural network model to detect it as a 45 miles per hour speed limit sign from any angle, even if you move the camera. Right, so that's like a kind of an interesting thing. Like, why does it do that? Obviously, to us, it looks like a stop sign. So why doesn't it to a neural network model? That's like a pretty cool question. Um, I also do a lot of uh, deep learning for Earth and space science. I do deep learning models for methane plume detection using uh, hyperspectral imagery or imaging spectrometers. Uh, models for uh, global vegetation structure, how tall are trees around the world? That's of import for carbon stock, measuring how much carbon is stored in forests and how much we're losing due to deforestation. Um, Models for biosignature detection and potential missions to Enceladus and Europa. They're ocean worlds, so there's a lot of water. If there's like things that are alive in it, we want to train models to detect that there are things that are alive in it. Um, and then we do some Mars rover orbiter image classification, which is fairly straightforward, where we have millions of images from Curiosity and Perseverance, and we want to help the scientists find what they're looking for, so we uh, run them through image classification models. So if you want to think of, uh, talk about that, I have office hours after this lecture for one hour in Annenberg. We're just going to walk over right now. Um, come by. Our, my next office hours after that is tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. I'm just going to be working, and then you can come by, ask questions about anything, lectures, homework, anything like that. All right? We got through it. Thank you. Four minutes over again. Uh, we'll work on that.